switch my device on it. Hello, YouTube, and we'll start the recording here. And you might need to click got it again, Mark. I'm not sure. <clears throat> okay, welcome everyone back to the water wetlands and watersheds seminar. All right, that's our YouTube going. Okay, let's turn that off. YouTube always wants to give me ads. Okay, welcome everyone. Our next water wetlands and watershed seminar. Um, we are lucky again to have another alumni of the Center for Wetlands as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the center. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Craig Diamond. Uh, Craig has more than 40 years experience in the fields of water resources, natural resources economics, and GIS, uh, as well as land use and transportation planning. He retired, although you'll see he kind of failed at retirement, but he retired as the regional manager for the Balmoral Group, which is a consultancy group for the public sector. He worked as a local and regional government planner and chief of state planning at the Florida Department of Community Affairs. He was also a senior researcher at Florida Atlantic University and adjunct faculty teaching environmental sciences, water resources, and resource economics. He's currently serving on the board of the Apalachicola Bay and Riverkeeper, focusing on resource management, and is also a member of Sierra Club's National Conservation Policy Committee. So Craig, with that, the floor is yours, please. All right, thank you, David. Right. Thank you, Center for Wetlands and staff for putting this together. Gee, you've covered my entire show just with that one introduction, but thank, thank you for reading it so clearly. No uh, Go good, for good, it. good morning still, everybody. Uh, it's November 1st, and I appreciated the invite to go ahead and participate in this. Uh, I was there for the Center for Wetlands 50th. It was a great event. And to some extent, uh, a little bit of what I'll be presenting touches back on a little bit of that. And I guess maybe that is why I entitled this Looking Backwards on Systems Thinking. Hopefully, uh, whenever I present, I'll be close to the mark for what um, David and Mark Brown and others have really intended by this particular season of, of seminars looking at, at water resources, wetlands, and watersheds. So uh, David covered uh, most of the background, just to recap only because I had already typed it into this slide and I didn't want to skip over it. Uh, I came to the Center for Wetlands with, with a bachelor's in math actually, and a few years in civil service, public works engineering and operations research. Uh, as he said, yeah, I failed at retirement despite uh, all that time in doing uh, uh, as a research and teaching faculty within the state university system at, at several uh, of the state schools and working as a longtime planner. And then more recently as a resource economist, I, I was just telling Mark Brown right before this call started, I'm still doing work for other nonprofits, um, even some of it being, being paid. Uh, so there's it's not always easy to give it up. And when, when people ask you to do things that you may be able to contribute to, maybe, uh, it's hard to say no. So at some point that may happen, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to keep uh, using what I learned at UF uh, in the field uh, in different applications. And I'll be covering some of that here. Uh, how did I get to CFW? Where did all that come from? Uh, I was loaned a copy of Environmental Power and Society by a high school friend. And uh, we were all sharing lots of information from our Buckminster Fuller, Gregory Bateson, the, a lot of folks that were involved in information theory at that time, this was in the 70s. So whatever was uh, available to, to the uh, public and not so much published research, but, but more popular text. And it had a big impact on my thinking about what I was doing and what I wanted to do. So I started to, to reconsider the prospect of grad school and discovered that uh, by the time I started looking, uh, Bucky Fuller was no longer teaching. He had retired in full. And the copy that I had, I guess it was an original one of Environmental Powers and Society, still had HT over at University of North Carolina. So I was all prepared to go up to, to transfer up to UNC and then discovered, my goodness, he was here in Gainesville where I knew people from high school and all that kind of thing. So that uh, saved me lots of dollars on moving and, and the, the concern about out-of-state tuition. So the transition to come to UF was, was made quite easily for me uh, thanks to HT coming back to Florida. So I was, I was grateful for that. Uh, I was at CFW from 1981 through 84. I, Mark still had me doing some work 
I guess there was some uh, project tied to planning uh, through funding from the Center for Government and Responsibility up at the law school. And I was doing some work actually for the city of Gainesville Regional Utilities with Ed Reagan, another CFW alum for the first few months of 85 before finally leaving town. Uh, I guess it was sometime in 1983 or so, I had already probably taken at least double the number of hours needed or, or expected for the master's in environmental engineering sciences. And it was time to eventually do something. Um, I know that HT had indicated to me more than once that it would have, you know, he would have preferred for me to go ahead and stay on and, and work through a PhD, but I, I had gotten tired, I suppose. He did sign on as my primary thesis advisor, had some kind of crazy negotiations with other faculty down in Black Hall and, uh, kind of left them out of the picture, even though they did have an influence on my work in water resources. I wanted to mention Mark, uh, I'm pretty sure I was the first student for which he was approved or authorized to be a formal thesis committee member rather than an advisory capacity as he had been on, on so many other students before me. So that was a, a neat opportunity to have him engaged at that level. <clears throat> uh, at CFW, I was tied into what other folks refer to as the theory guys, those that were more than happy to spend more time in, in front of a, a simulation screen uh, than the others who may have been well wiser and they were certainly much more practically oriented, the folks that were working heavily in field ecology and systems ecology. Uh, but I already had a systems backgrounds and I had a system background and a programming background and work in abstract math. So that transition was more comfortable and, uh, you know, took a lot to go ahead and learn more about the field side of things. Uh, I didn't have any fear about modeling and simulation since that was, uh, you know, it was expected of everyone. And, but a lot of other folks had their hurdles in, in dealing with that. I do remember one, probably the first or second term I was there, I think I had three different modeling classes um, with, uh, Clay, Kathy Ewell, and um, John Alexander, of all folks. So that was that was a lot of late night modeling all at once. And well, there's the there's the family photo, as you can see. Uh, that one was taken out of my thesis, just to remember that. Hey, mapping and and uh, doing an energy diagram is critical to understanding things. Um, the thesis work was actually funded by the Cousteau Society. I guess I was the second student. The first one, you know, Bob Christensen had worked on the Amazon and I got the Mississippi. He got the cool full field trip. Uh, I did not. Uh, simplified system. Eventually, you've got to be able to model and analyze these things. So things needed to be reduced. And I thanked Megan Sam for being able to get me access to a document that we worked on as, as the actual official report, not the thesis, but the report to the Cousteau Society that looked a lot more at some policy issues dealing with uh, the lower end of the Mississippi River uh, management scheme in terms of the Corps of Engineers navigation channels, diversions uh, down the old river and the Atchafalaya River and the like that looked at, again, some bigger issues than just simply energy flows and energy tied to that particular basin. But it was focused on water and watersheds so it certainly fit within uh, the theme for this particular um, series of seminars. So, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, what I did on my summer vacation, it's not to say that I only spent time doing simulations and uh, modeling concepts. Uh, I had the pleasure of working on a number of phosphate mine reclamation studies, lots of vegetation transects, many, many, uh, weeks and months with John Higman out in the canoe up in, in Hamilton County doing water quality sampling and uh, vegetation weighing and things like that. Uh, tree core gathering and tree core reading were a big part of work that was going on at that time. PhD student Mike Miller had given me lots of tubes, straws with uh, you know various diameter pieces of, of uh, cypress trees. So. I got some good experience doing root hair counting, weighing vegetation for Susan Vince, bringing her samples back from Alaska. As I said, a lot of tree core, core reading. We had even, we had done so much, we had burnt out the threads on the uh, transverse bar that transported the, the, the eyepiece back and forth for doing the reading. And we ended up losing some time while finding the one guy that knew how to make these um, 
uh, bars from from a machine and die shop out in Colorado. So that was uh, entertaining. It was a good way to spend the dark winter months um, doing that type of work and then supporting all that with the development of some databases and some specific statistical programming that was uh, oriented towards the work that we were doing, uh, including coming up with a data entry um, program for vegetation transect information that would automatically calculate, um, you know, dominance and things like that for the folks doing the field work. Uh, I mentioned before working, uh, you know, through Center for Wetlands on some subcontract work that they were doing for Center for Governmental Responsibility. Seminole County Wetland Study was was a, a big project. I had to go back and find that book. I actually, I'll tell you a story about that one a little bit later. It, it got a second life. Um, and I had uh, contributed a lot of paper to that one. And obviously those uh, uh, charts I presented earlier all came out of the work for the Cousteau Society uh, on the Mississippi. So that included simulation, energy evaluation of the entire watershed, an assessment of the surface hydrology, and uh, eventually leading to some policy recommendations for the Corps of Engineers for the lower river. That thesis was, was a challenge because I was convinced that the world worked a certain way. And when simulation produced some interesting curves that I didn't expect, I said, oh, well, what, the basin behaves differently and it affected how we looked at the energy of water at the end of the system uh, then at the top of the system. I remember HT had expressed some appreciation for, for that particular analysis. So I'd, I'd like to fess up or, or give thanks, if, if nothing else, that the scope of work that uh, was required and was optional, available to folks that were interested through CFW at the time, just provided me with a lot of principles and, and even some useful technical knowledge uh, to jump into a lot of different areas of work and not just one. So, uh, you know, CFW provided me with a lot of conceptual tools about systems thinking. Uh, folks that played a big role were HT, Mark Brown, Kathy Yule, Clay Montague, John Alexander. And I think that ultimately they all did make a difference in terms of the work I would end up doing after leaving CFW in the universe of, of watersheds and water. So thanks again, guys. <clears throat> So uh, just to remind you, this is supposed to be oriented towards the three W. I had put that in as a reminder to myself because I think I started adding projects that kind of went beyond the scope of what the seminar is about. But you know, these issues of water and the like do touch on many, many other areas. So questions I've got for myself and for you all is how can systems theory, modeling, energy analysis, analysis matter? with regard to water wetlands and watersheds. And secondarily, I wanted to know if it's possible to learn anything useful by osmosis. And I'll admit freely that during the uh, wetland seminars and system seminars that used to occur pretty much at the lunch hour for the four years I was there, I, I napped through a lot of them. People would find me nodding out in the back and it was usually caused by one or too many, too many burritos. So the real question is, did I learn anything while being semi-conscious? Hopefully you all still awake and, and haven't fallen asleep yet. So I wanted to actually thank uh, Mark for his review uh, during the CFW 50th anniversary, a couple of weeks back, <coughs> where he kind of organized uh, a number of his slides about the scope of work that CFW had done into a couple of key areas. So I thought I'd go ahead and use or, or emulate those to some degree and how those, whoops, pardon me, uh, how those came into play. So with regard to the universe of modeling, uh, actually shortly after leaving CFW, I guess it was about three years later when I was down at FAU Joint Center for Environmental Urban Problems, uh, I think EPA initially came to uh, Mark and Center for Wetlands to do the climate study, climate change study of the Everglades. And he suggested, go call Diamond down at FAU. And they did, and we ended up doing that work. So it was uh, modeling of the entire ecosystem of South Florida with a focus on Everglades uh, uh, gross primary productivity and what happens under various climate change scenarios. So that was fascinating work to go do all that and do modeling from scratch because the type of, of models that were available through um, 
the water management district really didn't look at any of these those other issues and were very focused on just simply uh, you know avoiding flood damages and moving water supply. So um, looking at the ecological and economic ramifications of water through the lens of climate change was a great opportunity to work on. Uh, I did get to work on other uh, hydrological studies, including modeling of, of Lake Jackson here up in Leon County, uh, outside of Tallahassee for the Water Management District. Uh, that was the first time anyone had actually used GIS to go look at the distribution of, of water chemistry data and also uh, to take a look at the at a true water budget for the lake, where I was able to go ahead and figure out that while they always think that car sinkhole lakes, um, you know, open up and close, everyone uh, failed to recognize that the bottom of this lake is actually always open. And really what goes on is, is uh, water level changes due to, to region wide groundwater um, uh, drops. Uh, for FDOT, well, I guess this is a little bit off from watersheds and, and, and water, uh, but a population growth and land use change model for I-75, but that was an actual simulation study and had to go write an original program for it. Florida agricultural water demand, this project is still ongoing. I think it's in its whew, uh, 11th year now uh, for the Department of Ag and Consumer Services, uh, where we actually look at crop mix uh, that changes over time in response to market uh, interests and how that affects water demand throughout Florida and whether or not particular agricultural tracts have implemented any sort of irrigation uh, uh, control mechanisms if they're adjusting their own procedures for, for water distribution. Uh, worked on a number of water demand and reuse studies for uh, a, a couple of the districts. And then uh, for Sierra Club of all folks I ended up looking at a wetlands impact model uh, due to water withdrawals for proposed big development down in Brevard, primarily Brevard County, also leaning a, a bit into Volusia County, um, being able to make it take advantage of through GIS uh, work that was done by the uh, St. John's River Water Management District, but discovering that there were a lot of uh, engineering errors in the applicant's proposal for what, how much water withdrawal was going to occur and what it would do to the groundwater table and then what that would mean for uh, superficial wetlands. So uh, modeling has, has not gone away entirely for me. Uh, energy and energy <coughs> put two together. Actually, while I was at UF, John Alexander was looking for someone to take on a project to do a preliminary energy analysis of the Upper St. John's so I've gotten to play a lot in the Upper St. John's River, uh, at least conceptually. And that, that was a, a, a great way to at least pay for beer the first term or two I was at UF. Uh, through HT, he had an associate connected with the U.S. Agency for uh, International Development, who had, my, I guess, myself work on St. Lucia and, and Jan Sensimer work on Dominica uh, from the perspective of en energy use. And we thought we were getting into some cutting edge approaches to international trade at the time, uh, having to go take an iterative effort to be able to pin down uh, basically energy to dollar exchange ratios for specific products. Um, tied back to that FDOT project I mentioned before, the basis for that was really looking at changes in regional energy use. Uh, if you go ahead and allow an intersection to be placed up and down Southwest Florida's uh, quarter from Tampa all the way down to Fort Myers, there are many more interchanges there than, than there were at the time that study was requested. The uh, state had gotten oil overcharge monies and uh, you know, looking at energy use and what happens uh, to the demand for that as growth occurs in the state was of interest to the energy office back then. So that was how that particular project came about. And uh, turns out that if you put an uh, intersection in somewhere, yeah, you're likely to go change land use and you will dramatically change energy demand up and down the corridor as, as you promote more tra traffic and uh, commercial exchanges. Uh, Senator Graham's office, when I was down at FAU, was very interested in the energy cost and impacts of offshore drilling. And when, based on the data at that time, you know, there was a lot of concern about oil spills in the Gulf. And it turned out that the uh, 
impacts of just simply the operations of ferrying oil back and forth to Florida, because that's the, it was the Eastern Gulf that was being looked at, were more likely to be uh, more impactful than uh, you know a blowout of a certain size. And <clears throat> I had not forgotten the role of energy and or energy in part of the broader dialogue about economics and development. So I ended up creating and teaching uh, classes both at FSU and FAMU for that matter, that would look at energy use, uh, ecology, or looking at an ecosystem services uh, approach to, to energy distribution and how all that ties back to economics and the different tools of measurement used for each. So it was kind of a, a comparative economics class that would also take a, a good look at energy. And that had not been obviously taught uh, at the schools up here in Tallahassee uh, any time prior to that. Economics, I think I have more than one chart on this. As uh, David mentioned, for the past dozen or so years, I've been working with a consulting firm that does almost entirely uh, public sector oriented work. So um, economics hasn't been far of what I've been doing. I remember HT, I think even during my thesis defense saying something about, you're thinking like an, ec an economist, think like an ecosystem scientist. So I had to kind of figure out what I was, what I, how I was thinking wrongly about stuff. But the experience at UF uh, led me to the opportunity to go ahead and look at the economics of water management in South Florida, initially funded by the Wilderness Society. And that had a huge impact. Uh, it was, uh, at least in Miami Herald, it, the outcome was bigger than the war in, in uh, Iraq, uh, the first Gulf War. So that was kind of fun to be able to supersede international affairs, even if only just for one edition of the paper. Uh, and then uh, 20 years later, the Everglades Foundation had asked me to go back and look at, has anything changed? Uh, basically redoing that study. So that was great. In fact, the methodology I came up with that was uh, for looking at how to allocate management costs that are expended by the South Florida Water Manager District uh, across its various um, outposts, if you will, the field offices and the locks and pump stations throughout the entire system uh, ended up being uh, used or presented in class by Jim Heaney down at Black Hall on a number of times as, as just a new approach to look at the allocation of cost and benefits uh, for water management. Um, having left CFW, I worked on a lot of, of uh, back then they were, now they're called CERCs, um, estimated uh, regulatory impact pro, um, analyses. Initially, even for DNR, you can see at the bottom of that slide back before it was even DEP, uh, looking at the cost and benefits of regulation to dune protection, coastal construction control line, manatee speed zones, all these were done at county level, sea turtle lighting, and uh, more recently, imperiled species management. So while not necessarily tied to water and wetlands and watersheds, um, I still think that the, the ecosystem tools that I learned allow me to ask the right questions about the benefits uh, or costs that attach to these regulatory efforts that I probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, economics part due. Um, water supply costs, that was a project also done for the Building of Society. Looking at water supply alternatives back when the cost of water was starting to accelerate in South Florida. Uh, there was an interesting project that the legislature funded about five, well, maybe six years ago now. Uh, we, and the money ended up going through the St. John's River Water Management District and then ultimately through the University of North Florida in Jacksonville to look at the economic value of the St. John's River. Uh, and that was farmed out to a bunch of different subcontractors, including the firm I was working with, uh, where we looked specifically at property value and proximity of the river, as well as the water quality of the river. So were there any negative impacts on property values and then in turn property taxes and the like, uh, if you were next to water that was a little less um, less green uh, because of algal blooms. So that was an interesting uh, set of regressions. And more recently working on wastewater, which is something again that I'd even worked on back at GRU uh, and a lot of projects dealing with stormwater treatment alternatives. Um, so again, looking at what the capital costs are for those long-term operating costs, and then presumably water quality improvements uh, to downstream water bodies and those, whether those yield any improvements at all in recreational value, property value, et cetera, as part of the uh, broader um, ecological services aspect 
of investments in uh, public infrastructure. A third one. Oh, my goodness. All righty. Um, sea level rise. So some of the work uh, that I've gotten to be able to do actually goes down to Australia, where the firm I worked with had its own office. Actually, it originally came out of Australia. So again, more cost benefit work. Uh, but this was tied back to sea level rise and, and their particular uh, uh, radical responses or, or impacts from coastal erosion, just like we've had some big storms here. And, you know, you see uh, all the hotels in the Daytona Beach falling into the ocean. They, they've had equally, equally um, extreme problems there. Uh, politically, they're willing to go ahead and confront the notion of retreat, managed retreat as, as a viable option, certainly when you look at what the cost and benefits are of doing so, something that we're not ready to quite get to yet, although I'm sure it will be looked at. Uh, more recently, working uh, with the Gulf of Mexico Alliance on HABs in the Gulf, uh, we were able to go ahead and use a lot of NASA data uh, to look at offshore blooms and their locations, and then do the, uh, the economic side of all that, looking at loss of patronage in hotels and rental properties and what have you to figure out what the uh, uh, impacts were to the entire uh, 23 county coast, uh, Gulf Coast of, of the state of Florida. And uh, kind of piggybacking on that, uh, the Charlotte, Charlotte Harbor, now it's the Central Heartland. They changed their name a couple of years ago, National Estuary Program had asked us to go ahead and look at what were the benefits, environmental benefits of all of the um, public investment, both at the state level and the county level, and in some cases, even municipal level, to protect environmental resources from land acquisition, uh, habitat rehabilitation, uh, water quality cleanups, including, you know, even wastewater treatment uh, investments and the like, and to see what all that translated to throughout th through the jurisdiction of the entire CHNEP, which I think was like 13 counties. I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly the number of that again. So that was nice to go ahead and be able to kind of focus in at that watershed level to uh, get a feel for what the scope of investment was in resource protection and get a feeling for uh, what the regional benefits were. For political purposes, all those counties do wanna see a return on their investment. So it was an opportunity for all of the stakeholders in the CHNEP to get a sense of their, their relative impact on moving the needle for environmental protection in that corridor. Uh, policy stuff. Moving on to another theme, uh, Greenway's plan. Uh, when I first started with the city of Tallahassee in Le Leon County, um, I was asked basically one question, can you come up with a Greenway's idea? And went ahead and did a lot of mapping and a lot of uh, photo, uh, stereo photo interpretation, some field work, uh, needed to go ahead and make sure we knew what type of trees we were looking at in the false color infrareds and came up with a Greenways plan that ultimately Thousand Friends of Florida gave their, their state award to. That's still being implemented now, uh, uh, 25 years later, uh, in terms of investment. You know, even before I left the city, we had bought tens of thousands of acres and we spent uh, 35 plus million dollars even by then of uh, state and local money on uh, developing an interconnected greenway in, in, in Leon County. I had mentioned before the water supply plans and water demand studies, those also fall into policy because they end up making recommendations for prioritization of, the, of alternative investments. Water reuse study was one that involved GIS that initially started in Florida and Southeast Georgia. It was a NEFSEG, uh, Northeast Florida, South Georgia project. And they liked the outcome of that and extended it to wanting to know more about uh, water reuse and water recharge throughout the entire South Coast. So uh, the revised project ended up looking everything from Alabama, the entire state of Florida, about two thirds of Georgia and about half of um, South Carolina. So uh, it was uh, another good opportunity to go ahead and look at, at wastewater reuse in particular. Uh, other applications of, of things learned at, at CFW, included uh, you know, use of GIS in looking at water quality. Uh, so it was an interesting project done at the Indian River Lagoon, where in response to sea level rise and changing uh, water depth and the diminishment of photo available light, 
we could look at areas where um, restoration for seagrass beds was more or less viable based on existing water quality and, and disbursement or, or, or turbidity levels in the water. So if the water levels rise too much, you're not going to go ahead and be able to go ahead and have a lot of success in restoration because you'll have too much attenuation. Um, another project that was in a way disappointing got to do a huge database from uh, created out of multiple data sources uh, for water quality in and around uh, Tallahassee and Leon County to um, compile everything that had been collected since the late 60s and to try to figure out what was going on in the lakes and then ultimately tie that back to watersheds because now we can go ahead and do that in GIS and look at changes in land use and what the impacts were on lakes. And uh, this was just at the time MPDS permits were, were coming on and you know Tallahassee was scheduled, I think in 93, 94. I remember talking to the assistant city manager at the time now long since gone about, well, you know, we can use this information for helping us with land use decisions. And they said, hell no, we're not gonna have water quality dictate what we go ahead and decide upstream. So, uh, Ultimately, nothing ended up happening with that, but there was a, a big database generated uh, that compiled all that information over several decades uh, across multiple watersheds and water bodies that had not existed before. Uh, Seminole County, I had mentioned this uh, before. Uh, so this came back, having enjoyed that project and put together all kinds of information about uh, uh, recommended policy, comp plan language and the like for Seminole County for wetlands protection, developing a, uh, a wetlands key unique to the county. There was a proposal by a former legislator to basically to develop basically a thousand acres east of the econ in Seminole County. And at the time, a uh, firm I was working with was actually contracted with to support the county's planning department doing population projections for all the cities in the county. Um, and also to support them with anything to do with comp plan work if it was needed. So asked me to come in and see, well, uh, is this proposal consistent with the county's wetlands policy and most significantly, whether or not it was consistent with their urban, uh, urban boundary policy. Uh, and it failed on every count. I had the uh, opportunity to go ahead and present to the county commission and basically gave, I gave a gentleman's deed of, to the applicant in one area where they at least provided some data, but they had failed to meet all the county's thresholds. They, they sued multiple times to go ahead and have their land use approved and, and have been rebuffed continuously. So I, I think that project's finally dead. Uh, over the years, I've been working continuously on Everglades restoration and uh, sustainability. I hinted a, a couple of minutes back about the use of NASA data. Uh, we got the opportunity to be be a vehicle for translating data, uh, remotely sensed data that NASA collects uh, regarding ecosystem services, and then using that information to set up some seminars that we ran from Texas all the way to Florida to the Gulf Coast to see how they could better use remotely sensed data in their own work. So um, that, that still continues uh, to some extent. Uh, and of course, the data is continually being collected and constantly refined. So there's now a, a channel to go ahead and, and see how that's applicable to ecosystem services valuation and try to continue to support, um, uh, especially the uh, national preserve managers and the like. Um, again, as an outcrop of the broader environmental work that uh, I was exposed to at UF and through CFW, I've had endless uh, opportunities and, and challenges working with the Sierra Club on a range of different uh, policies. Uh, again, there's a short list there, urban infill, that was a two year project, light pollution, uh, you know, coming up with new definitions for that, recently wrapping one up on updating a 1972 policy relating to the protection of marine mammals. Uh, PFAS, uh, about to go ahead and get started on the economic aspects of electric lawn equipment and how do we manage agricultural methane? So these things don't go away. Other, <clears throat> I think it's really only due to exposure to HT and the, the time spent at CFW that I've had opportunities to go ahead and chat with people at systems level about interesting stuff. So uh, somewhere 
long after leaving um, UF, I had uh, reached out to G.E. Hutchinson, who was HT's mentor up at Yale. And I had been influenced, as I said, at the top of this session uh, by Gregory Bateson's approaches to system thinking as well. So I had some exchanges with him about how he thought about his his uh, disciples and how they looked at things. He looked at them very differently. Um, again, Bateson was not a, a uh, alumnologist or was not really a field scientist. So they had very, very different approaches to systems thinking. He thought that they complemented each other, but, but came at it from very different directions. Uh, Stuart Brand, the guy that had uh, created the whole Earth Catalog. I remember being in discussions with him about energy in California, impacts on the Hatch Hatchie Valley. Uh, and how all that ties back to what makes San Francisco click. Uh, I, I am sure that the content of that would have been small uh, without having a richer understanding of things gotten through CFW. Uh, for years until he passed, I had continuous dialogue with Matt Reed, who uh, was the uh, uh, chairman of the board for the South Florida Water Manager District and had been Nixon's appointee as assistant um, director for the uh, Department of the Interior uh, on Everglades restoration and sustainability. Um, that was a, a, an ongoing thing that still occurs through the Everglades Coalition. More recently, uh, working on Apalachicola River elevation, if you will, uh, trying to get the issues of the river brought up to a national stage uh, through the offices of Senator Graham. And as another student of HT's, Don Blancher, who uh, we, I got engaged with inadvertently through project through my last employer. Uh, he still helps put on the mobile bay symposium, which I guess is biennial, uh, which does feature lots of valuations of coastal ecosystem services. So um, he had uh, invited me to go ahead and do a presentation there. I guess it's now three years ago. Anyway, uh, so that's just sort of an interesting scope of, of stuff. So now I have to re-ask those questions. Uh, so how can systems theory, modeling, and energy analysis matter? And I feel that looking backwards on all this stuff, it certainly underlies a lot of the dialogues and advancements that I've been on the edge of in terms of environmental policy and decision making at local, uh, regional, and, and maybe even some national levels. And if you were curious about whether it's possible to learn anything by osmosis, I think so for all of you who aren't yet sleeping in the room or on your, on your video. So there, there is hope to go ahead and, and pick up useful information. Uh, so what do you do? What, what's, what's the uh, directive that comes out of this scope of, of experience and looking backward at, at 40 plus years? Uh, modeling is incredibly useful. How do you get your thoughts aligned about how this system operates? Can you apply basic ecosystem principles? Can you close the loops? Can you find the correct inputs? Can you weight them and, and, and do you know what all the internal uh, intersections are of, of various energy throws, uh, flows? So whether it's a, a mini model, a macro level, or, or at a detailed level, they're all useful. So you're always encouraged to go ahead and do that. Uh, it's important to measure stuff, whether it's in energy, energy, or dollars. Uh, you know, again, still dealing most recently for the past while on, on the, the dollar side of things, the right-hand side of those energy diagrams, uh, those were important, uh, especially when you're dealing with national policy, regional policy and the like, because uh, folks don't readily understand energy or energy, but they do understand dollars, certainly um, decision makers in, in, at the county commission level, legislature and, and Congress when it works. Uh, think of things in those terms. So to be able to make those translations is critical. Uh, I was talking to Mark um, just before the call started uh, relating to a project I'm still looking at currently on biosolids for the um, uh, Thousand Friends of Florida. And the part that I haven't yet finished yet is all the work in dollars because ultimately that's where the, the decision makers um decisions come from. If you can simulate it, do so. Uh, you want to understand what scenarios are likely and maybe even a couple that are not likely and see how your model behaves. Spend the time to evaluate it. And I underlined apply it because at the end of the day, you really do need to see that this work has an impact. 
uh, bring it to bear, whether it's through a journal, whether it's through a county commission meeting, be able to go ahead and present the findings that you've got and, and hopefully carry the day with it. So I think that was it. That's a black screen. So um, I may have gone through all that way too quickly. David, let me know. No, you're good. We have 10 minutes or so for questions. So let's give a round of applause to Mr. Diamond. So thank you very much. And we'll take questions from the room to start. I'll check on YouTube here. Oh, we have a question yeah. from YouTube. Yeah, David. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Hi. Um, Hi. So I imagine modeling and the technology and availability of data has changed quite a bit over the past few decades. Yeah. So I <laughs> Wondering, um, has that had an impact on the way that you approach systems thinking and kind of your approach to modeling for these different projects? That's a great question. I, you know, to be honest, well, yeah, a little because obviously things like spatial data now do make a difference because it just greatly expands the scope of what you're willing to to contemplate. You know, I, I still have to think at, at CFW, and you, I don't think there's a piece of equipment there um, that you could look at from the perspective of, of being an antique collector, but before we even had the equivalent of the, uh, the early versions of the IBM on Zenith machines, uh, we had these uh, 16K machines that could produce colors. And that was great because you could do a, a color simulation and follow your different uh, storage values more carefully. Uh, and you could only, you know, program that much in basic you can't see my hand but uh, you know you can only write a few pages and otherwise the machine just would would choke on it and not run and now you know you can do whatever you want you know using a variety of tools so the scope of data does change things a little bit um or a lot of bit um i'm, I'm thinking about uh, just because i covered it here the nasa data so when we end up pulling in the NASA data, it's it's gigabyte upon gigabyte of you know 15 minute reviews of, of some you know uh, infrared scan of, of a quarter of, of property out in the ocean somewhere. So the amount of data is enormous. So you you do end up having to spend a lot of time that you wouldn't have spent earlier, basically pre-processing information to make sure that you can use the information because it's it's never going to be in the format in which you need. You, you're going to have to do things to it to, to tease it, to, to address the questions that you're hoping to ask and answer. So I guess there's a lot more time that is going to be required to do the, uh, the machinations of pushing data through a model. But the conceptual modeling itself, I don't think changes. I think that's part of the beauty of, of, of HT's approaches to this kind of stuff. So you may be jamming a lot more information along those pathways of inputs to the model, but the behavior of the model itself uh, probably doesn't need to be rethought dramatically. On the other hand, you've got a lot more data about more things. So you may have many more inputs to, to consider as useful. And of course, that's that's always been a lot of the, the art of knowing what crosses the boundary uh, uh, and you know what needs to cross the boundary and what's optional to cross the boundary for, for thinking about this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. We have a question from YouTube. Max Chow asked, "What this is a maybe a long one? What's the difference between energy and energy?" Mm -hmm. Everybody is schooled in that, and there's sort of a rarefied oh, okay, um, well, lexicon. Okay, well, uh, thanks. Gee, and you've got so many experts in house there, like Mark and others. Uh, and I'm sorry for for speaking in, in in lingo. And I just figured, gee, anyone who's housed or connected with the Center for Wetlands would have that. So uh, the notion of embodied energy goes back to really work in the 50s that HT had, had initiated in looking at all of the energies that contribute to a particular product or process and the need to go ahead and put them all in a common denominator with the recognition that different types of energies have different qualities that sunlight energy is capable of doing some things while electricity is capable of doing a whole lot more. And that when you measure the, the heat value of, of a unit of energy, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie, a BTU is a BTU is a BTU, but different energies do different work. So there'd been uh, decades of, of, of an assessment 
on how to better tune those relationships and come up with reasonably coherent and stable values for one type of energy versus another type of energy. And when we convert all of them to a common denominator, say you did it in, in solar equivalent joules or solar equivalent calories, you can look at the, the composite of a product or, or a process or some outcome uh, that better reflects the contribution, especially of, of natural or renewable energies versus fossil fuel energies that contribute to it. I'm sure I'm giving the, the definition a, a woefully short uh, approach to it, but it's a recognition that that energy is different in, in quality and impact uh, in their interactions. And you need to have a means to go ahead and, and uh, combine them in a common basis and energy or used to be embodied energy uh, is a vehicle by which to do that. All right, thanks, Craig. I'll let Mark, if he wants to jump in. Otherwise, any more questions from the room? I, I've got one question, Craig. It might be a, a broader philosophical one, but over your time in systems, um, how do you think the receptivity of a systems approach to a lot of the analysis that you've engaged in has changed? And then um, equal to that, what agencies or organizations that you've worked with seem to be more receptive or less receptive to a systems sort of thinking? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I, I don't think that receptivity has really changed. Obviously, you know, in, in talking to the folks at, at NASA on that particular project was literally about ecosystem services. So so convincing those folks didn't require that was really what they were interested in doing was how do we do a better job of of using the vast vast volumes of uh, remotely sensed data across multiple different bandwidths and tools uh, to bring them down to earth literally for ecosystem services uh, in terms of the agencies in, in Florida and the like I, I don't think it's changed a whole lot so you know it wasn't the only notion behind the idea that you need to translate stuff to dollars that matters but you can still be comprehensive in, in an approach to an issue that uh, an agency is confronted with so that you're leaving few to no stones unturned in terms of what you evaluate. So there's a systems perspective attached to that. And then uh, you know, you're in a position to certainly elevate their relevance, uh, whether it, you know, presenting it in terms of, of, of modeling or a schema or something graphical, it really depends on whether those particular folks, you know, tune into that visual uh, to influence their thinking. You know, folks, some folks don't see that and they're happier looking at tables with numbers in, in bold digits at the bottom that tell them, you know, yes or no, this is less, that is more. So I can only offer that, that you still do the systems thinking and you carry it through to the vehicle that works for the agency's interests or, or uh, what they're trying to suss out. Thank you. All right, any other last questions from the group? Well, if not, let's give another round of applause to Mr. Diamond. Thank you again for the retrospective. We appreciate it. It was great to see you uh, two or three weeks ago, whenever that was. Really appreciate your uh, coming to speak with us today. And for everyone else, let's see. Next My pleasure. Week, everyone gets to go have lunch now. Yeah. Let's see. Next week, we will be hearing from, let's see. Sorry. Internet is being slow. Silly. Ah, yes, we have Dave Tilley, and I believe he is coming in person. So we'll have Dr. Dave Tilley, who's an associate professor at the University of Maryland. Um, and so we will see you next week on Wednesday. Thanks, folks. Hey. Thanks, Craig. Pleasure Thanks. being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.